We have an exciting uh, program for you. Uh, we have uh, Stephen Alexander joining us, uh, who together with Don is going to talk about uh, the new things uh, with IMPA and ShipServe. Um, then we have Liam Herbert, who's going to talk about our spend analytics project and the solution we have out for the market now. And then I have a few uh, insignificant things I want to share with you. Uh, and please uh, ask questions uh, when we have a small uh, break in between the sessions. Uh, if there's something you're really, really interested in asking uh, right away, uh, please try to hold it back. Uh, no, you, ca you can ask if you want. So initially, a very quick uh, corporate update uh, or intro from, uh, from ShipServe. Uh, then the partnership thing with the uh, IMPA, Spend Analytics. Uh, our supplier performance report and the new uh, invoicing solution that we are launching uh, very, very soon. So about ShipServe, we have worked uh, in the digital area for quite a while and we are very happy that, that this is being more and more, uh, uh, you can say, the mainstream uh, conversation you have about this, that everyone wants to do something within that field. Um, it's about using data in a proper way to produce useful insights uh, to your daily operation and your uh, analytical work uh, within procurement and sales. So when we look at this, uh, this is not about showing how fantastic everything is, uh, that we are just growing and growing. What is actually the interesting part for us is the fact that the whole area in blue is data. This is data that we have collected over the years and data we can use to produce all these uh, different statistics. Um, and we can do it in an aggregated way, which means that we can actually use it for a lot of different things without disclosing your names, the quantity uh, you are buying, the price you're paying, but we can still use it in an aggregated form. So there are a lot of opportunities out there to, to actually work with this uh, information. So the things we are going to talk about today is a little bit on the buyer side, a little bit on the supplier side. Um, firstly, the process automation, which is the foundation for everything we do. Without the transaction flow of requests for quotes, quotes, POs, uh, and uh, order confirmations, etc., we could not do any of the other things we, we are doing. So that is the, the foundation for everything. Uh, because of that, we on the buyer side can produce these benchmarks and uh, provide all these analytical tools that we provide. On the supplier side, it's a mirror of this. It's about transaction efficiency. It's about, again, getting this transaction engine to work. Because if you have that working, you have all the information you can work strategically with. Um, so those are the two uh, ones we're talking about, uh, going to talk about today on the supplier side, the green and the, and the red box. So to give you a little flavor of the segments that we're working in, it's actually not limited to any sector. We are very broadly represented in the marine industry, uh, small ship owners, large ship managers, line, tramp, uh, gas, crews, etc., etc. Uh, and what we have done here is we have taken the ISS fair play data uh, for the number of ships uh, and we have compared that uh, to the fleet that, that we have on our platform. Uh, so that's the representation. And down to basics, this is about the transaction efficiency. So on the buyer side, you would have the ship raising the requisition, uh, the purchasing uh, office handling that requisition uh, with one single connection to ShipServe's platform. And because of the solution we have on the supplier side, there is a possibility to enable 100% of your suppliers. There's no limitation. Uh, there's a solution which is free of charge uh, as a basic, straightforward solution that you can use forever for the amount you want. There's no limitation on anything. And because of this spread in supplier solutions, there is an opportunity for you as a buyer to enable 100% of your suppliers. This is extremely critical uh, for the success of this. And that's actually what we did between 2004 and 2005. That was the time we launched this spread in supplier solutions. 
And that's when transactions really started to, to take off. Some of the time uh, reduction that the owners are getting, it ranges from about 15% to 30% of the time they, they spend on, uh, on handling transactions. And of course that uh, time can be spent to either let some people retire and don't replace them. Uh, it could also be a way to actually work with the freed up time, work more strategically on logistics contracts, on other larger contracts that a buyer typically has very little time to work on. Uh, and that is what we see, uh, that, that that is what the time is spent on. Just a quick uh, look at uh, the range of clients we have. As you can see, all segments uh, in all regions of the world, small, large, it ranges very broadly. And we have some partners we work with, and this is very important for us as we, in the very early days of ShipServe had the vision to replace procurement systems and launch this web-based system that we all thought would replace everything out there. Uh, it did not take us very long time to realize that replacing a procurement system is not something easily done because it's linked to accounting, to crewing, to insurance, to all sorts of other systems. So we changed the strategy and decided to work on integrating to all these partner systems. And that is what we have done since. Uh, and we more or less have integrations to all the standard systems out there, plus loads of bespoke integrations, um, which is a must in this industry. You have to be able to integrate systems. On the supplier side, a few of the key suppliers we have, uh, many of them here are integrated, which means that they benefit exactly the same as the buyer. Uh, on the integration, they exchange the information electronically with no retyping uh, as a consequence. And with this, I would like to hand over to Don and Steve. For those that don't know me, my name is Stephen Alexander. I'm COO of IMPA um, in the UK. So I've been working with the Marine Stores Guide for about 20 years now. Um, and <clears throat> we've got some exciting developments with the data and the use of the data which we wanted to share with you today. Um, Don's going to do that bit really so what I'm going to do is just set the scene a little bit about the Marine Stores Guide. I think probably everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say the Marine Stores Guide, don't they? Um, anybody not know the Marine Stores Guide? Nah. So it's probably the thing that IMP is most known for around the world. And uh, about 10 years ago, with ShipServe's help, we launched the data. So you can buy the data and put the data into your systems. Well, <clears throat> um, that's gone very well. And we've probably got about 8,000 ships that are registered with the data on board and in the office. The Marine Stores Guide is not perfect. Um, probably there's quite a few of you in the audience that might feel that there are some errors and inaccuracies within the guide and have thought maybe what's happening about that. And it's been a little tricky, but we think we've got a solution now, don't we, Dom? Yeah, he nods. So the data could be used by companies, suppliers, and ship owners and managers in their own systems internally. But what was lacking was what we've introduced this year, which is the publisher license. And what the publisher license enables manufacturers and wholesalers, and I can see several in the room, what it enables them to do is to publish their catalogues linked to the Marine Stores Guide code. And that will mean that through their systems and what we're about to present or what Don's about to present, you'll be able to get much more information, brands, product specifications, uh, charts and graphs from products. It's the missing link that we are now able to uh, provide a solution for. So. I, I hope this will resonate with you and, and will be 
of value and interest to your business. And I know it is with s some of the people we've been talking to. So that's just setting the scene. I'll hand over to Don. Thank you, Stephen. <clears throat> so we are, we are indeed excited about this, and we think that we have together found a, uh, a solution to take a major step forward. So I'd like to start by showing you some numbers. Um, 101, 48,000, 1 million plus, and 4 million plus, and 28%. And I'd like to explain what those numbers mean. 101, that is the combined years of publishing experience between IMPA and ShipServe. IMPA with the Marine Stores Guide, and ShipServe between Pages and its forerunner, which was the Mariner's Annual Ordering Guide. So over a century of experience, there are 48,000 items, approximately, in the new IMPA Marine Stores Guide. Now, about the same time that we set up the data license distribution with IMPA, we also launched a website which is called the IMPA Web. And you can find it right now for a very short time before it gets updated with the new things if you go to the Marine Stores Guide and you hit code search. And we don't advertise it, we don't promote it, and somehow it gets over a million hits a year. It's really astounding the, the amount of volume that that gets for people searching for IMPA codes and products. Now, ShipServe itself, our search engine, which we do promote heavily and advertise, that gets over 4 million hits a year. And finally, 28% of ShipServe's line items carry IMPA reference codes. When I learned that, I was actually astonished. Because if you take the spare parts and the services out, we're talking about probably approaching half of all the line items going through ShipServe have IMPA Marine Stores Guide references. That is really cool. So now, as we know, IMPA is the most complete and neutrally generated source of information on marine stores. Now, ShipServe is the largest collection of manufacturer and distributor specific information. And so what we've always told everybody is when people ask us, well, what's the difference between IMPA and ShipServe? We show them that, and then we say, if you have both, you don't need anything else. You, your, your life is now complete. But the logical question then has been, well, why should a user have to go to two different sources to get this information? Why do I, if I look up the IMPA code in the Marine Stores Guide, why do I have to then go to ShipServe to find out where I can buy it? If I'm looking at a product in ShipServe, why do I have to go to the IMPA Marine Stores Guide to figure out what the code is? Right? That it's a, it's a, a disconnect that's existed. And then finally, how can IMPA move to a crowdsource assisted evolution of the Marine Stores Guide? Right? right now, up until now, the entire burden of maintaining the Marine Stores Guide has been on IMPA and its partner Fuji. And everybody in this room and everybody outside this room, the, the thousands of suppliers and thousands of shipping company, companies have all this knowledge which can be used to improve the Marine Stores Guide. So how can we get all that knowledge to start to funnel into uh, helping the Marine Stores Guide take the next steps into the future? So what we are introducing, uh, Stephen told you about the IMPL Publisher License, and it allows manufacturers and distributors to publicly map against the Marine Stores Guide database. And it can be used not only in ShipServe, but in their company websites, in uh, printed promotional materials, and on ShipServe as well. With that, we have the new ShipServe hosted IMPA Marine Stores Guide. So the old IMPA web is now being replaced by the new uh, hosted website. So it replaces the old website. And what it does is it leverages the search and the presentation capabilities of ShipServe with the breadth and generality of the Marine Stores Guide, creating what we think is a win-win for everyone. And in so doing, this will encourage more suppliers to map their products to the Marine Stores Guide. Now, um, it will be shortly available on ShipServe's 
website, there'll be a, a link right next to our search box that's going to show that, and I'll, you'll see it momentarily. There will also be a link to, from the marinestoresguide.com website and in ShipServe on board. So very shortly, this is what the ShipServe homepage is going to look like. And you will you see up at the top right, it's the link to the Marine Stores Guide. And so when someone clicks on that, they're going to be taken to this IMPA page. And let's take a look at some items. Let's take a look at, for example, at safety equipment. And then drill down on life jackets and life boys. And now we see a beautiful representation of the IMPA database. And if you've seen what the old IMPA web used to look like, this is, it had no pictures, it, the descriptions were short and limited. So this is, this is really nice. But then, then the critical thing is that when we find an item that we like, we click on details. And now, now this happens to be a fairly um, simple product in terms of description. If there was more information, it, it would appear here. But now what we see are companies who have linked their catalog to this item. And what this shows is what the supplier part number is and the unit of measure, how the supplier describes the item. And if the supplier has provided a product spec sheet, it shows up at the top. And if we mouse over it, it enlarges. Now, we've taken some inspiration from Amazon here. OK, everybody here has used Amazon, yes? right? When you go to an Amazon page and you find a product, if you scroll down, the first thing you see is people who bought this also bought. right? And so if we take a look at this page, this sheet, if you have a man overboard marker and a life ring, those kind of go together, right? First, first you need one and then the other. Uh, but they can group anything on there. But then, if you keep scrolling down on Amazon, you see the detailed product specs. And on a page like this, they can put all of the, the important details of this item. And some of them can be quite extensive. Now, if you still want more information, you can actually view the item in the supplier's catalog. And now we're taken to the supplier's detail, where we can see all the information that the supplier wants you to know, including their, uh, including their, uh, the spec sheet. Now, what, you, what you've noticed now is that the left side of the screen has changed, right? This is now the drill down that you would get if you worked from the supplier side. So if you went into ShipServe and you chose Daytrex, and you started working through, and you came to this life ring, you would get to this spot with the IMPA reference. So you, you as, a, as a user, you'll be able to come from the specific side and find out the general reference for something. Or you can come from the general side, which is the IMPA, and find the specifics. And the process that's now going to result from this is that as the suppliers do those mappings, they're going to say, but wait a second, what about these five products? Or what about the fact that this IMPA code really refers to three things and not one? And here are the three products. And what we will be able to do is we'll be able to facilitate the conversation back to IMPA and say, here's what suppliers are telling us. And that will help with the evolution and migration of the Marine Stores Guide so that the, the, the pace the pace of improvement will hopefully pick up, and it will become even more relevant, even as it retains the general neutral nature as the, as the source of, of information for consumables. I would like to thank you know, Stephen and Susan for this 18-month journey that we've been on. That this is the, you know, this is the, the launch of it. Uh, it's, been, you know, it's, it's been exciting, and, uh, and we look forward to even more exciting times as this now goes forward. Next is Liam Herbert, and Liam is uh, on our solutions team, and he's going to talk about spend analytics. For those that don't know me, my name is Liam Herbert. I'm one of the solution directors at ShipSurf. So what we're going to talk to you 
today is talking data and specifically data within marine procurement. I think this phrase sums it up quite nicely as to what we want to try and achieve out of data. So that is, the goal is to turn data inf in, into information and that information into insights. But insights that can deliver real tangible business values. So what type of value are we talking about? So when we look at the data, data, the information, the insights, we can provide things like spend analytics reports. So things like answering those questions such as how much have we spent on a specific brand? How, much, how many litres of lube oil are we ordering each year? Those sorts of typical questions in most buyers are not available at the touch of the button because they don't have that data, they don't have that information to be able to support those pieces of uh, analytics. Contract compliance. So once you have a contract in place, how do you know that your company is maximising it to its 100% ability, so 100% utilisation? And if you are having any maverick spend going on, what, do you, what can we do about it? How can we redirect some of that spend to who the preferred suppliers should be? That all requires data to be able to support that. Sourcing and tenders. Most companies we speak to say they have around 40% of their spend under contract, but they all have a desire to want to increase that if they can do. The challenges they have is they don't have the data to be able to support that so that they can push those, increase those contracts, those e-tendering solutions, those sourcing events. They miss that data to be able to do that. Benchmarking. We don't particularly have very good benchmarking in the marine industry. A lot of it is very uh, generic, very um, uh, macro. So what we can now start to look at is specific benchmarking, specific benchmarking on things such as products, lube oils, benchmarking ships. So if you have one ship type, how is it doing against the rest of the industry based on the data that we have on the platform? Also in terms of what is your spend for a specific piece of equipment, specific system versus other companies who have the same types of ships and the same type of equipment. How much are they spending versus what you're generally doing? Manage risk. Changing suppliers inherently adds, adds risk to the whole business. Not knowing how those, those suppliers are performing on a day-to-day -day basis. So, for example, on-time and full deliveries, are we changing it to a supplier that has a high percentage of on-time and full deliveries? mitigates that risk that when you wanted to change suppliers. Obviously, if you change suppliers and they don't deliver and, and the ship can't sail, any, any benefits that you had by changing suppliers would immediately be eroded anyway. So predictive analytics, using some of that data to be able to support you, and where should we look at contracting? Where should we look at using uh, catalogues, for example? Automated procurement. If your business is highly transactional and, and you can understand the context of what these, when you're having your requisitions and your transactions coming through through your systems, that can all be automated at the end of the day. If you have a preferred suppliers list, you can then utilize the systems to be able to redirect those RFQs straight away if you wanted to. Also, you can start to look at areas such as catalogs as well and use catalogs to be able to do direct orders to suppliers. And finally, is picking the right supplier. Having the data to be able to support that when you are looking to go for a new supplier, do they have the right capabilities? Do they have the right attributes? Without the data, it's just another opinion at the end of the day. So when we look at the data, what type of data sources are we talking about? So this is not an extensive list. This is just some indications, but these are all areas. Also, you've got the, the IoT, you know, in, Internet of Things. But the, the area where we're focusing on strongly and where we see a lot of value can be achieved is in, the, is in the transactional data, that flow of information from the buyers and the suppliers. So we actually obviously can see the data happening on the platform, but we polled last year our clients, and 73% came back, said that they found it difficult or extremely difficult to be able to know how much they were spending on specific brands and specific products, and that was primarily down to poor data quality. That was the key reason that was given for that. So how can data quality be proved? Again, these are just a range of areas where data quality can be improved, increased use of catalogues, better data governance at the, at the buyer side and also at the supplier side. Having unified data, 
you know, one single source of truth at the end of the day. But this is not new. I've been in the industry for 20 years. Yeah, I might not look like it, but I have. And, and we were talking about this 20 years ago in, in, in the shipping companies, and it hasn't moved forward at a great pace with any of the buyers at the moment. So is there a reason to that? Primarily, the reason is down to the cost. Cost versus value. So when you look to want to cleanse your data, there might be time, there's time, there's resources, there's, there's, um, you might want to have to change the system to be able to support your business. That all has a cost impact. And you need to know that there is a return on investment. There's that tipping point to be able to say you're going to get the, the value out of that. So the value at the moment cannot be quantified really from a lot of companies. So they choose not to do anything. So we're here remaining in the status quo. However, when we want to look at approve the transactional data quality, there is another way. So, for the past few months, ShipServe has been using machine learning to help cleanse and, and uh, categorize the transactions that we are seeing on the platform. Um, I'm, I'm assuming most people, unless you live on the moon, has some understanding of what machine learning is, or maybe you've heard the phrase machine learning, but I want to show you a two-minute video just to give you a brief overview as to what machine learning really is. Our ability to learn and get better at tasks through experience is part of being human. When we're born, we know almost nothing and can do almost nothing for ourselves, but soon we're learning and becoming more capable every day. But did you know that computers can do the same? Machine learning brings together statistics and computer science to enable computers to learn how to do a given task without being programmed to do so. Just as your brain uses experience to improve at a task, so can computers. Say you need a computer that can tell the difference between a picture of a dog and a picture of a cat. You could begin by feeding it images and telling it, this one's a dog, that one's a cat. A computer program to learn will seek statistical patterns within the data that will enable it to recognise a cat or a dog in the future. It might figure out, on its own, that cats have shorter noses and that dogs come in a larger variety of sizes, and then represent that information numerically, organising it in space. But, crucially, it's the computer, not the programmer, that identifies those patterns and establishes the algorithm by which future data will be sorted. One example of a simple yet highly effective algorithm is to find the optimal line separating cats from dogs. When the computer sees a new picture, it checks which side of the line it falls on and then says either cat or dog. But of course there can be mistakes. The more data the computer receives, the more finely tuned its algorithm becomes and the more accurate it can be in its predictions. Machine learning is already widely applied. It's the technology behind facial recognition, text and speech recognition, spam filters on your inbox, online shopping or viewing recommendations, credit card fraud detection and so much more. At the University of Oxford, machine learning researchers are combining statistics and computer science to build algorithms that can solve more complex problems more efficiently using less computing power. From medical diagnoses to social media, the potential of machine learning to transform our world is truly mind-blowing. To find out more about me... OK, that was a, a video produced by the University of Oxford. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a, an idea as to what machine learning is all about. So how are we applying machine learning at, at, at ShipServe? So we are using machine learning to be able to look at the transactions that are coming into the platform and to, as I say, provide some structure, classification to those, to those uh, transactions. So as the video showed, we need to train the model. We need to train the computer to see patterns and some statistical variations. So what we see here is that we have a subset of transactions that we have on the platform, which is then prepared. We prepare it in a, in a way that we make sure that it's, each of those transactions are classified and tagged. We then go through a process of normalization what does that mean? That means just we take out the noise words that are within some of these transactions. And we also apply some metadata in terms of categories, brands, and, and catalogs. And that all feeds into, into the algorithm. That then falls into a prediction model. So we work in, in, in a situation where we want 99.9% accuracy, ideally. Once we get to that level, we then start to flow in the 
real transactions in a real life, live environment. It goes to the prediction model and that then classifies those transactions. So that classifies it in terms of a category and a subcategory. And it also looks at cleansing the data. So cleansing the data insofar as looking at brands and picking out those brands, ports, and also quantities and units of measurement. So when a, if you are thinking of something like lube oil, you want to be able to use that to, for comparison purposes, you need to look at the lowest common denominator of unit, units of measurement being liters. So if you see a lot of transactions which are done in drums, for example, we are then pushing that back down to, to the uh, liters you know, measurement. But there are issues. Sometimes we get it wrong. So then we have to go through and we then have to reclassify that data. So at the end of all of this, we have the live transaction coming through. That is maintained. But also we then enrich that data with a brand, with the quantities, and with then the port information. And then any other information in terms of model numbers. So that then enables buyers and suppliers to be able to use that data to be able to support their business. So in terms of a supplier, you can use that to help you so that when the transaction comes in, it's dirty, we can push the clean transaction, for example, into the supplier system. But vice versa, it allows the buyer to be able to use that data to, to, to come up with some ways to produce insights, such as spend analytics, for example. So just to give you an example as to why we're using machine learning and, and some of the things we found, so 880 different ways a 70 TBN cylinder oil was expressed on ship surf. Wow. Um, what that really relates to, to put that into context, is there are 7 to 10 different suppliers of lube oils. So each has one product, which is a 70 TBN product. So ideally, you would like to see that that figure to be in the region of 7 to 10. So it just shows you the volume of duplications that we're having to deal with with just one specific product on the platform. So that's the stuff type of stuff we are doing at ShipSurf to try and help and cleanse the data and what we are dealing with. So one of the outputs from that is Spend Analytics. So Spend Analytics is a product we're, we're releasing in Q, Q4 of the, this year, 2018. So this will be available initially to the buyers. So what it gives you, it gives you the information with regards to total spend, transactional information in terms of uh, number of quotes and number of supplies you're using, spend per category, and if you uploaded the contract information, what your spend is based on the contract. In terms of the supply matrix, so these, these bubbles that you can see there, that's relating to categories, and the size of the bubble is proportional to the number of supplies you're using. So if it's a large bubble and, the, and there's a lot of spend going on, then that means there's a lot of fragmentation of your spend. So there's ways you can, you can look to uh, um, leverage that better to have better economies of scale. And also, if you have a lot of branches worldwide, you can see how they're performing shown at the bottom. And then it moves on to things such as benchmarking. So benchmarking your own vessels um, versus the market industry, market standards, sorry. Um, also looking at how you can uh, utilize that data to be able to give you some savings. So you can see there, there's a column there for projected savings. They are real life savings that, that other clients have been able to to realize. Breakdown by brand. So again, asking questions such as how much do I spend on a specific brand of pump, for example, most buyers struggle to answer those questions because we have that data, because we've been able to tag it with that specific brand information, we are able to now show that here. Also in terms of the quality fragmentation, made it mandatory for suppliers to specify quality on each of their, their RFQs. So now we, we can track that through and know exactly when the order is placed, that is that order placed for genuine quality parts, for example, or is it for alternatives? Um, supplies by brand. So, for example, in this example, it's showing all Weiler uh, pump spares and 17 different supplies, for example, have been used for that one specific brand of pump. So when we talk about economies of scale and leveraging your spend, these are ideal ways to look at how you can reduce the number of supplies you're using to, to fewer. Answering those questions, and so what are we actually buying from these suppliers? Again, a lot of buyer organizations unfortunately struggle to answer those questions. We're, we're, we're able to support that now to show the type of categories you're buying, but also what type of brands you are buying from that particular supplier. And also, are they authorized, if you have a genuine only policy, for example, are they authorized to be supplying those spare parts? 
as we can detect the ports with a, with a complex algorithm, we are now detecting the ports in the transaction so we can then map to show, and this is real-time real live data when the transactions hit the platform, so we can actually see what type of, this is an example showing for lubrication oils. So in the top right, you can see that the, uh, sorry, top left, you can see in the legend is the type of lube oils. So you can see in a given time frame as to which ports are, are we picking up lube oils. And obviously, if some of those are non-key ports, you would, you would be notified straight away. Some things in terms of location specific. So what are we picking? What type of oils are we picking? In what ports? But also, this pink column on the right-hand side is talking about surcharges. So there's a lot of uh, situations whereby these type of surcharges, minimum order quantities and short notice fees, these are completely unavoidable costs, assuming you plan correctly. Often, though, these charges are small charges in a purchase order that has a high value. So a high value of $20,000, for example, when you have a little $250 surcharge at the bottom. Um, so it just gets lost in the noise. We're able to obviously pick that now out so it can give you some, some insights as to where you should ta start to target. And finally for me, just in terms of price tracking as well. So we can now use that, aggregate the data and be able to support it with market average prices. So what are you paying versus the market average? And also, is there any trends in the industry? Is the price starting to soften or is it, is it starting to get... Uh, is it starting to increase? When should we start to have those discussions with our lube oil supplier? So these are just a few snippets of what we're doing on the data side of it, what we're also looking to, to deliver, and one of those products is, is Spend Analytics, as I say, at the end of this year. Thank you very much. I'll pass you over to Mikhail. So a little bit more of, uh, about the, the other types of analytics that we, uh, that we uh, offer. Uh, before we get into the invoicing, which is the last uh, piece. We just had the impair introduction uh, by Stephen and uh, Don. And uh, before the launch of that, we actually uh, provided a tool for the uh, buyers to benchmark the impair number uh, on the platform. And as a lot of the buyers are using uh, impair numbers, this was possible. So they could actually uh, log in and see a trend of of a certain item with an impair number, what the price range uh, was in a specific port to see if what they pay is above or below the average. Again, it's aggregated information, uh, so no specific buyer or supplier is disclosed here, except for the ones that the buyer is actually dealing with. So the suppliers that specific buyer is dealing with is of course visible to that uh, buyer. The supplier performance report is, um, you can say, an extension or part of the spend analytics, the whole thing that you, that you want to do with your, uh, with your spend, that you uh, also get a way to analyze your suppliers. Uh, and equivalently, we have a tool on the supplier side where they can work uh, strategically to analyze their buyers. And this is the whole philosophy of what we do. We have never been a buyer platform or a supplier platform. We have always focused on being a platform, creating efficiencies and uh, transparency throughout the whole chain, so to speak. So the supplier performance report for the buyer, this is uh, the buyer side, will provide a, a quick overview of um, of the spend, the RFQs, the quotes, etc., with that specific supplier. Um, it will also give the buyer an idea about how many RFQs have been ignored, uh, etc., etc. And on the supplier side, we provide a similar thing, the sales funnel. How many RFQs have you received? How many quotes have you sent? And what is the success rate on your uh, RFQ to post, uh, POs, uh, for example? Uh, it will also give you a value, uh, how much of the volume from this, uh, from this period, this is a period that has been taken from, has been done through direct POs, that means no foregoing RFQ quotes, and how much of it uh, is through competitive POs, which means situations where the supplier has been in competition with other suppliers. So staying a little bit with the supplier side, um, the next level of this is uh, the level where you also, we'll get an analysis on the time to quote. How often have you won when you have been the fastest to quote? Um, 
what is your average quoting time, what, are your, what is the competition, uh, that their quoting time. Um, do you believe that quoting fast is equal to a likelihood of getting the order? Perhaps you need to quote faster if you think that is true. Uh, do you think the price is the most important factor? Uh, then you need to be competitive, of course. Perhaps it's a combination. Uh, it probably is, but at least you get a very quick way of being informed about how you're doing compared to the average, and perhaps that gives you some ways to, to see if there's something that you need to clean up in your organization. And on the right side, a PO, a value analysis per client. Um, and drilling further down to this, uh, you will again uh, have the overview of the, of the clients on the left. Uh, you will have the time that you, it takes you to quote these clients and also the PO value you get out of it. So again, you can combine the time you, uh, your quoting time, your prices to the success rate and work tactically, strategically with that. So going back to the buyer side, um, so the buyer will get an overview of the total spend that they have with a given supplier. Um, it will show the trends over the period that the buyer has defined. Um, it will show the response rates, how many RFQs are you actually responding to, what is the average for all the suppliers that you're dealing with, and what is the ship serve average. So again, it gives you an idea uh, about uh, how this supplier is performing with you as a buyer. But this is also a good tool to use with the supplier uh, as a tool when you have the yearly negotiations, because there could be some issues where you say, to me, it's not really important how fast you quote. It's more important that you are competitive on the price and that you deliver, because there could be issues uh, related to deliveries as well. Other KPIs provided along these lines is uh, the average response time, the quote completeness. Um, quote completeness is an interesting thing. Uh, why does a supplier only quote 8 out of 10 line items every time? Perhaps it's because the buyer always asks them something they don't sell. Right? This is something you need to discuss. But again, this is a collaboration tool. It's not a one-sided tool. It's something for both sides to, to use. Competitiveness uh, in this uh, situation. So we will also measure when you on the buyer side are sending RFQs out to multiple suppliers, whether the price was the most important for you or the time sensitivity. In other words, how quickly the supplier responded to you. Um, again, something that you can use in your uh, discussions with, uh, with your suppliers. And on the co-quarters, um, those are situations where you have actually asked other suppliers for quotes, you have received a quote, you have sent the PO. And when you do an analysis on this uh, supplier, we will actually display to you the other suppliers that you have asked throughout this time period. And we will tell you if you have decided to buy more expensively from this supplier than from others. Uh, of course, there can be deviations in the number of line items. There could be some changes. But from a general perspective, we can give you an indication that you may constantly pay more. Maybe it's a decision on your side. Maybe you have decided to pay uh, more from a supplier because you know that supplier is always delivering on time and the right quality and all that stuff. That's, that's fine. But at least it will be flagged to you. It will also be flagged to you that because the supplier side here is probably thinking, well, that means that every time I'm out with my, uh, my, uh, my buyer clients, I have the risk that someone else can squeeze in and get the order the next time because ShipServe is helping the buyer to see who is cheaper. Well, it also works the other way around. Perhaps you are cheaper and they've chosen someone else. And the next time, you as a supplier are actually the one who will be suggested to the buyer. But again, it's about visibility. It's how development goes. Uh, and the old days where everything was something in between two, or between two people uh, having an agreement about something, it's, it's kind of over. 
there's uh, so many tools available out there to, to, to work strategically with the procurement. Again, one specific supplier here. What do you buy the most from them? Um, what uh, does each of your uh, purchasers uh, spend with this supplier? And again, the spend per vessel. Okay, invoicing. So, invoicing is a subject that has been discussed, uh, I think also from when I started in this, uh, in this part of the marine industry, so around 2000. Uh, a lot of companies talked about, uh, we want invoicing. Okay, so what is it you want? Well, maybe you can tell us. No. We need to understand what it is, uh, the, the need is out there. Um, and there are many invoice solutions in, in, the, in the market space already. Uh, a lot of them are focused on workflow. So there will be invoice software that you install in your, in your infrastructure. And the moment you have the invoice in the system or import it, it will go through the workflow. You need approvals, uh, et cetera, et cetera, maybe uh, superintendents, maybe fleet managers, and so on. So that part we're not touching here. So what we're doing is that we have developed an invoice platform. Uh, you can call it a portal. Um, and if you look at the, the ShipServe philosophy from the early days, is that we want to create a space in the middle where we connect buyer and supplier. That's what you see on the top here. So the whole flow between buyer and supplier is run through our platform. Buyers connect once, suppliers connect once, and everything flows there. It is exactly the same we're going to do with invoices. So our platform will be used as a platform where suppliers can upload the invoice, match it to the PO, and the same information will then be available on the buyer side. So they can import it into their internal workflow. So it's a platform, a collection area for invoices. And then you can ask yourself, from the buyer side especially, what, what, is, what is that benefiting us? We already have asked our suppliers to send invoices to us. Yes, but if you think about it, you have one supplier, they're dealing with you, and maybe 50 other buyers, or 100 other buyers, and every buyer wants them to send to a different email address, to log in, to upload, to do all sorts of different things. That is going away with what we are launching. We give them one place to upload their invoices and then they can be extracted to the buyer side. That's the whole idea. That's the whole original idea of TradeNet, uh, and that's the idea of the invoice uh, platform. So going back to this uh, first one, so that is the, the first version of it. It will be the platform. The next phases in this will be credit notes, um, delivery receipts, etc., etc. There will be split orders, there will be canceled orders, there will be all these things that, that you need to deal with as well. But primarily, you need to deal with them in your internal system. But those are the next phases that, that we will uh, come out with. And I have a few uh, screenshots of what the solution will look like, both on the buyer and the supplier side. So the supplier interface will have, uh, when the supplier logs into this, will have an overview of uh, the POs they have received, uh, with pending invoices. Um, they will have a section uh, with sent invoices and one with draft invoices. This is just to, you can say, pick up everything. If you're in the middle of something you have to leave, it will save it as a draft. The work is not lost. Um, so the supplier will then go into each of these POs and will be asked to and as you can see, the information is already pre-populated, the PO number, the vessel, etc., all these basic information. Um, the supplier will then uh, enter the invoice number, Oops. the invoice number, the invoice date, uh, a due date. Um, they will attach an invoice, uh, and they will also enter the invoice value, if there's freight, if there's specific discount they need to enter. Uh, and when that is done, they will submit the invoice, which then initiates uh, an email notification to the buyer side uh, that an invoice has been uploaded. 
And this email, uh, email can go to either the purchasing team or finance team, whoever you decide is the recipient of, of this. Uh, we just had a question today from one of our different solutions uh, that if, if you send an invoice to one location, if another one can get a copy, of course we can configure that as well. So the buyer will have a dashboard very similar to the supplier with the invoice number to the left, the PO number, what supplier it is, um, and the overview on the top that the POs which have not received invoices, this screen is where invoices have been received, etc. They will be able to open the, uh, the system and get into the more detailed level of, of the invoice with the original PO value, the invoiced value, whether there's a freight cost, in this case the, case the freight cost is the uh, deviation from the original PO value. Um, and when they're happy with that, they can add a comment, which can then go back into the system. Uh, they will approve the invoice, and that's it. But the system will also have the possibility for the buyer to either get the original invoice sent to them, or we will do it as an API so you can import the data straight into your system. So the full automation will be achieved uh, with a solution like this. So that's the basic invoicing platform which is going to be live very, very soon. Um, and uh, this is contrary to what we have also tried in the past to launch uh, products which have not been tested properly in the market. What we are doing here is that we are launching a solution that we know from uh, some very large and significant buyers is sufficient for their purpose. Uh, and then we have seeked a lot of input from other buyers and will continue to do that. So you can continue, consider this as not work in progress, but first version of something that will be developed to cater for all the things that uh, are needed in, in an invoice, a full-blown invoice solution. Thank you very much for coming and I uh, hope you will enjoy the rest of the show.